Welcome back to the show. Today we're talking about democracy and four pillars that will make it stronger in Canada with the host of the National Leadership Briefing, Doug Sharp. I got this impression that I was supposed to help people vote. I had never voted before in my life at that point, so I had to learn everything. And I realized that at, through this journey that there's a lot of people out there just like me that don't really know what to do. And over the last 20 years, that's what I've done, is spent all my time helping other people have influence in this realm. As the world is right now, the lone wolf out there, the individual, can only have so much influence. We really do need to come together to use our combined voice. The laws uh, that we uh, pass in our parliament, they are able to limit our rights. So the rights in the charter can be sort of held back. The entombment of Christians is what I believe we're heading towards. You're seeing court cases, you're seeing uh, laws that are passed that are limiting our rights. That's when you're going to have some problems, and we've seen that. Pastor David Lynn was arrested in Toronto, taken right off the streets in handcuffs. We want parliamentarians that will fight, mm -hmm. and so that's, that's the time we're in right now. Freedom, liberty, protection for the most vulnerable amongst us, and economic prosperity. These are some of the main reasons why people from all over the world for generations have come to Canada and sought to call it their home. What has made Canada so great in all these areas? Well, I'm sure that there are many answers to that question, but one answer, without a doubt, was given to me by a Jewish leader and national advocate who said this, Canada is great because all throughout its history, people of faith have been involved in building it. And he went on to say, Canada will continue to be great if people of faith continue to stay involved in shaping its future. Engagement of good people who love this nation and want to see it stronger for future generations is undoubtedly one of our greatest national assets. But what happens when some of our national strengths, such as liberty, freedom, care for the needy, and economic stewardship, begin to crumble? Worse yet, what happens when good-hearted people who have the power to make positive change don't, simply because they don't know what to do or where to start? Why do I ask these questions? Well, it's because on a regular basis, I'm speaking to Canadians who are concerned about where our nation is going. They're concerned for our freedoms, for our children, for our economy, and for the vulnerable amongst us. And out of this place of concern, one of the most common questions that we get asked is, what can we do? Well, this is precisely why I am excited about today's show. With me in studio is Doug Sharp, the host of something called the National Leadership Briefing. Doug has been involved at the grassroots level in Canada for years. He has served in nonprofit advocacy work on major political campaigns, as a member of several EDA boards, and as a civic engagement trainer in churches, and the list goes on. Most recently, Doug has been mentoring Canadians and how to strengthen four key pillars that he believes are key to our nation's future. You may want to grab a pen and paper if you want to be a part of the change that our nation needs. I know that you will find Doug's insights very helpful and practical. So without further delay, let's get to it. Well, Doug, it's so great to have you in studio with me today. So you're the host of the National Leadership Briefing. And on this briefing, it's a call that happens once a month, you've been talking about something called the four pillars. Okay, so let's talk about pillar number one. What is it? Wow. Pillar number one, this, and pillar number one is the first pillar for a reason, because by a long shot, the feedback we got from the church and the leaders in the church and the people in the pews was that, that the, they really just wanted to have, as parents, the right to raise their children the way they wanted. That's, that's, all they, that's all they cared about, to a high degree, way beyond any other pillar. They just wanted to be able to raise their children with the same faith tradition and in the same way that they were raised. And to have that freedom to do it was really important to them. So that's the first pillar. And how chilling that people would express that, obviously, out of reading a bit of the court, that this is under threat. Yes. So uh, yeah, absolutely. very telling. Very yeah, telling. Yeah, absolutely. So let's see. We're going to skip uh, pillar number two because okay. we're going to come back to All it right. after the break. But let's go to pillar number three. What is it? Heart well, of it? Well, pillar number three really uh, is the heart. What I think is the heart of the church. It's it, the, the people that I spoke to were saying that they really wanted the laws and policies that were enacted and passed by civil government to provide for the safety and security of the citizens. But there was a caveat. They also had a particular passion in their heart or compassion in their heart 
for the vulnerable that live among us in our communities. Mm -hmm. So the, the civil government passing laws that provided for the safety and security of the citizens, but especially the vulnerable, was really important to the church. And any time I brought them a solution that would provide for that or help advance that idea, they got real excited about it and they wanted to get involved. Wow, how beautiful is that? Mm. And again, how telling, because I think sometimes Christians in Canada get branded as, you know, sort of being anti-abortion, anti-this. Oh. But what that pillar shows is a, a real heart of compassion. Absolutely. For the vulnerable, and I'm assuming you we're talking senior citizens, we're talking the disabled, we're talking children. Absolutely. Uh, the poor, beautiful. Um, yeah. Pillar number four, what is it? Well, pillar number four was, it was a bit of a no-brainer for me, but it was, it was surprising again when I echoed it back to them. Uh, we always hear about the amount of debt that civil government is taking on. Civil governments have continually spent more money than they have. In Ontario, it's out of control. Nationally, the money is being spent way beyond what we're taking in. Mm -hmm. Well, the people that we surveyed really felt, that, and I'm going to use their language, that it is inappropriate for civil government to heap debt upon the backs of our children and future generations. They looked at the debt crisis in Canada from the perspective of their children being born into their world as bond servants of civil government. They wanted their children to be free. They didn't want their children to have that yoke of excessive taxation placed on them. So as soon as I started, because we've been talking about government debt for a long time, but as soon as I started saying, well, what you're telling me is that government debt is important to you, but only to the degree that it impacts your children. And they went, yes, yeah. that's what I'm really concerned about. And that was really an eye-opener as well. Wow, and again, beautiful, because it yeah. shows just the heart for the other, right? Yes. And so those are three of the four. We're going to come back to number two in a second here. But what are you telling people to do with this? So you've identified these three pillars. What then? Well, here's the, and that's exactly the challenge, is because it's one thing to understand that those are your ideas and that they can have traction and you can actually have favor in the community when you share those ideas. But how do you articulate them in a way that gathers support around them? Because as... As, um, the, as the world is right now, the lone wolf out there, the individual, can only have so much influence. We really do need to come together to use our combined voice when we speak to issues like this. So what we do is we actually teach people how to bring support in larger numbers around your ideas, gather them together, gather the people around you, and speak in a unified way so you have more influence as a group. That's wow. what we've been doing on the National Leadership Briefing. That is so powerful. And the reality is, is almost every other community in our nation does that at some level of organization. You know, I heard They're somebody, very good at it, yes. <laughs> I heard somebody say once that leaders give uh, articulation to the silent groan of the masses. Mm. Uh, if that's true, you're a great leader, Doug. You're, you're giving uh, words to that, that groan. June 2020, something incredible is happening. The Canada Summit for National Progress. This is a strategic gathering for people who love Canada and want to see it reach its full potential. At the summit, you will hear from knowledgeable speakers who are experts in their fields, giving insight into some of our nation's biggest challenges. Then together, participants will dream and strategize, looking for ideas to solve these challenges through policies, inventions, innovations, or community initiatives. Some of these ideas will be launched right at the summit to impact the lives of Canadians for the better. We believe that the Canada Summit for National Progress could be one of the most significant transformational gatherings in our nation. Canada needs people who can face problems head on, but then look past them with a spirit of hope to find the solutions. We hope you'll join for this cutting edge gathering of dreamers, innovators, and doers. Let's build a better Canada for the future. June 2020, to find out more or register, visit canadasummit.ca. Register soon as capacity is limited, www.canadasummit.ca. Due to uncertainty surrounding COVID-19, this year's event will be online, which means you can participate from anywhere in the nation. We hope you'll join us. We love Canada, and we want to see it strong for generations to come. That's why we do this show. We can't do it alone. We need your help. Unlike commercial TV, this program is 100% donor-funded. If you'd like to see more episodes produced on important issues for our nation, please consider signing up to be a monthly partner or giving a special gift today. Every gift makes a real difference, and all gifts are tax deductible. Together, we can build a better Canada for the future. Visit fayteen.tv or call 1-866-844-0844 to donate today. Thanks for your support.
What's the role of faith in the public square? Is there a role in it in the 21st century, or is that an anachronism from the past? Uh, we've embraced this notion, I would call it sort of the post-enlightenment myth, that religion is a purely private matter. Mm -hmm. And it's not. I mean, there are private elements to our faith. Faith throughout human history, religious belief throughout human history, has been lived in the public square, because no faith is lived out singly. I can't think of a single religious tradition where you live your faith as solely an individual, but rather that faith is lived out in community. Faith must be present in the public square if we are to have a genuine common life together. Um, and so I think this is something we need to recapture in our country today. One of the comments that I often got following my election was uh, from those on the other side who don't hold to a faith, they would say to me, Rachel, I understand that you're a person of faith, but now that you're in public life, you're going to put that aside, right? Yes. And there was this expectation that somehow I would just step outside of that and put it on the back burner. And, and my response was this. I said, you know, I said, I, I, I suppose I could put that aside. But let me explain what that does for me, and then you tell me whether or not you want me to put that mm -hmm. aside. Mm -hmm. It gives me an incredible compassion for people. It means that they come before me. It means that I am passionate about pursuing the, the, what the needs of the vulnerable are and taking their defense. It means that I absolutely am committed to protecting freedom of religion, freedom of speech, freedom of belief, freedom of conscience, regardless of what that belief is. It does not have to be my own. I will protect it because I believe in that for my country. It means that I will pursue human rights and making sure that they are protected. And I went on and I, and I explained what it meant in terms of showing compassion for people and dignity for people and advocating for the family. And at the end of it, I said, would you like me to put that on the back burner as I represent you? <laughs> Absolutely not. No. Absolutely not. Okay, Randy. Sure. Um, uh, freedom of religion is enshrined, as I said, in the Charter, and I will protect the right of a faith-based group to uh, practice their faith freely in their own uh, uh, in their own church or place of worship as they please. And I think our laws do not uh, penetrate the walls of a, of a of a church, and you're free to do that. Uh, however, I will not uh, change the laws of a, or go into uh, the bedrooms of people and, and choose who they want to love. Uh, but you would have every freedom uh, to preach to your congregation based on your faith. And so are other congregations allowed to do the same. And that is protected in the Charter and that will be protected. And I will always stand by that, right? Uh, we've never gone into churches and told them how they should practice their faith and nor should anyone else. Okay. <laughs> so, pillar two. I'm going to read word for word off of the website. Those we elect to serve us in civil government must respect and defend our right of belief and freedom of religion. Now, on the National Leadership Briefing, Doug, you talk about the entombment of, of the Christian faith, of Christians in society. Unpack that for us in light of what we just watched there. Okay. <clears throat> Pardon me, and there's so much there. By the way, that's an excellent clip. Uh, I, I hope people watch that over and over again. There's so much there to learn. Uh, the entombment of Christians is what I believe we're heading towards. And, and I believe that, that what's happening is, is that in our Charter of Rights, we have that preamble that we always focus on where it says the supremacy of God and the rule of law, and we celebrate that in our 1982 Charter. We go straight to Section 2 of our Charter of Rights and Freedoms, and we celebrate the freedom of religion and freedom of conscience and freedom of speech. And, and, and we skip past the all-important Section 1. And section one of the charter says that, that all of the rights that are outlined in the charter are actually um, uh, subject to the laws that are passed by our lawmakers. So the laws uh, that we uh, pass in our parliament, they are able to limit our rights. So the rights in the charter can be sort of held back. Um, this is what's happening is, is that you're seeing court cases, you're seeing uh, laws that are passed that are limiting our rights. And you heard that last uh, member of parliament uh, the, in the clip that, that was, um, uh, it was the very end where he had the panel of all of the candidates lined up. He was talking about and making it sound really great that you could say anything you wanted, that you could have the right of free speech, that you could have do anything you wanted inside the walls of your church and that the laws he said it was really important to catch his language didn't penetrate the walls of your church 
So as long as you're inside your church talking to your church family, then you're okay. But if you take it out into the street, that's when you're going to have some problems. And we've seen that. We've seen that with some pastors. Pastor David Lynn was arrested in Toronto, taken right off the streets in handcuffs, and then released with conditions under the law was the terms of his release. And, uh, and we're actually slowly, we're getting our rights of free speech limited to take place only in our churches. That's what I mean by entombing of Christians in the church under the laws that are being passed in Parliament. Wow. Very concerning. And so what are you coaching people uh, to do in response to this? Well, the very, the very best place to tackle this is, is actually at election time because we, don't, we, we encourage our people to, to do things a little bit different on the national leadership briefing. We don't ask them to run around at election time and ask their politicians to make them promises. What we do is we ask them to ask their politicians and their candidates to make commitment statements. And the commitment statements are grounded in the four pillars. Everything that we do in the, on the National Leadership Briefing, we do through the lens of the four pillars, we say. So on that issue of the, the, the second pillar, we make sure that our people get commitment statements from members of parliament that they will not, if elected, the candidates, if they go to the House of Commons, they will not pass laws that in any way disrespect their right of belief and they actually, we actually want them to make a commitment to defend right of belief when they're there. Because that's, that's a big problem right there. That's why it says in the second pillar, we want them to respect and defend. Because a lot of parliamentarians think it's okay to sit in their seats in the House of Commons as we're getting attacked, or as our, our right of belief is being attacked. And we don't believe that that's, that's what the citizens of Canada want. We want parliamentarians that will fight. Mm -hmm. And so that's, that's the time we're in right now. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, in the first segment, we, you talked about moving as a corporate voice, mm -hmm. right? Moving together as a community that believe in these four pillars. Mm -hmm. And so the National Leadership Briefing is a monthly contact point for that. How do people get connected with it? Well, you go to nlbcanada.ca and there's a registration link and you just register and then once a month you're sent a link to a Zoom call and you can join the call with us. You just come on and, and join. And what we encourage people to do is, even though it sounds a little repetitious at first, we say, no, get on the call, try it a couple of times, invite a couple of friends, have them invite a couple of friends, bring more and more people on. And what you'll find is over time is you're building an understanding of the four pillars that we teach and you're also not just learning the four pillars you're actually drilling and training using the four pillars to gather support around the ideas in your community as well and then of course we encourage it also for people to share the national leadership briefing so we get more and more people all talking about the same things on the same page okay great yeah. so it's nlbcanada.ca that's correct Okay, and now it's a daytime call though, Friday, 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Yeah. If people work during the day, can they still get in on this somehow? Absolutely, at the National Leadership Briefing, we, uh, we take, do the call during the day, and then if you're registered for the call and you can't make the call at that time, you're sent an email at the end of the day that has the video of the call, mm -hmm. plus all of the resources that we've shared during the call. So if that day we're talking about right now, the, a big subject is the uh, Conservative Party uh, leadership race, mm -hmm. then we'll make sure that they have all of the resources available for that attached to their email so they don't miss a thing. Okay. Now we just got a couple minutes left here, sure. but you mentioned the Conservative leadership race. That's going to yes. be a hot topic here for the next several weeks, um, but you're launching something called Operation Engage. Yes, okay. exciting. Quick snapshot, okay. elevator speech. What elevator is speech, really quickly is, is that traditionally what everybody always does is they take their candidate, they prop them up on a pedestal, and they say, we're looking for that one person to save us and carry our views and values forward. And we're doing a little bit different this time. What we're doing is we're putting a platform up and we are actually sharing the ideas that I believe that we've gathered through the people in the church and we've accurately synthesized them into some platform planks and policy positions. And we're actually gonna encourage other candidates to adopt those. Well, if we get a large enough number of people supporting the platform, that, that it's an attraction to the candidates to come over to shop these ideas, 
then I think we're going to have a winning situation here in the in the leadership race. We're going to advance so our ideas. So your hope is that the, the ideas behind the four pillars will literally infiltrate everybody's hearts and minds and that they'll want to pick these up no matter who they are. I can't wait. I can't wait to share it. I've been sitting on I just And people are <laughs> going to be able to see it if I can give the web address. It's conservativeupdate.com. Okay. Conservativeupdate.com. Okay. So, Doug, we got 15 seconds left here. Why don't you look in the camera over here? What is your word of encouragement to Canada at this time? It, for this year, it's engage. Don't hold back. Now is not the time. If you're waiting for the perfect time to have great influence in Canada, you couldn't have waited till a better time than right now. We have an opportunity in front of us right now in Canada to have great influence, but we got to come together, and that's going to mean separating and putting aside some of our differences and just focusing on the things we share in common. Amazing. Thank you for being with us. Thanks me. for having me. I'm excited. Thanks. This is a real honor today. I have Candace Bergen, the Honorable Candace Bergen, with me. She is the official House Leader of the Opposition Party, the Conservative Party of Canada, is also sitting on the special COVID-19 committee and uh, served actually in cabinet with the Harper administration as well. Thank you so much for being here with me today, Candace. Good to be with you. Thank you for having me. So Candace, give us a little update of what is happening with Parliament. Are you sitting? Are you not? What does it look like? Been lots of controversy about the construct right now. Give us a crash course on what's been happening. I'll quickly just give a little bit of background for, for those sure. who, uh, just as a bit of a, a background setup. So when the whole COVID crisis hit in mid-March, um, all of the parties made a decision very quickly to, uh, for, for Parliament to suspend. And we basically suspended for a total of three weeks. There were already two weeks break in, in that time. So we suspended for about five weeks. And I think that was the responsible thing to do. But I can tell you, conservatives never thought that we would continue to suspend through the crisis. We felt that parliament needed to be sitting, not just a committee or not just a, a, an accountability session, but we got to the point where we felt parliament should sit in a reduced number. We never felt that 338 right. of us should come back. So that's what we had been fighting for specifically in this last week and a half, uh, because there were different kind of benchmark dates that we had to make decisions as a whole parliament around. So this last um, Monday, May 25th, parliament was, resume, was scheduled to resume. Conservatives wanted parliament to resume with its full powers with the power of the opposition to do our job, um, with the power to have um, opposition days, to have question periods, to be able to have private members business. There's a lot of power that parliament has uh, a, a, as a group, as a body. It's why our democracy functions. And it's us meeting in person in Ottawa. And that's what conservatives wanted to do. The liberals don't wanna do that. And so what happened was on Monday, the liberals teamed together with the NDP to suspend Parliament until September 21st. Now, in its, in its place, they've put a committee, which is a, a special committee on COVID, whereby we can ask questions about other issues, but a committee has very limited powers and really very little reach. Very, there's very, uh, not a lot that we can do. So that's where we're at right now. We have a, uh, what I call a fake Parliament. We have a glorified committee and we don't have parliament. And it's actually uh, the time when we need parliament more than ever. The tools that opposition would normally have in parliament have been stripped away. And so we cannot pressure the government when it comes to their handling of the COVID crisis currently. When it comes to, uh, as we are trying to come out of the crisis and have some economic recovery with what some are concerned about could be a second outbreak. There's no parliamentary oversight to what the government is doing. There's no parliamentary oversight to the billions and billions, close to a trillion dollars in, uh, in deficit that they are racking up. 
absolutely no oversight. And then in addition to that, the government is making other announcements, for example, uh, around uh, law-abiding firearms owners and making them into criminals. There is no parliamentary oversight on that. And we don't even know what else may come. We have the Canada-China issue. We have huge issues right now around uh, what China is doing uh, to their own, to Hong Kong, people who are from Hong Kong, uh, as well as their relationship with Canada. Faitine, there is just a lot going on and Parliament should be sitting so that members of Parliament can do their job. And the Liberals and the NDP have, uh, have basically just bypassed democracy. Well, I think most Canadians are indeed concerned about this. One of the great things about Canada is just that our democracy. Where do you go from here? So you obviously feel like Parliament's not working. Is there any recourse that you have as the official opposition to challenge this further? Well, um, in Parliament, it's a minority Parliament, but the, the government, if they have a, what we call a dance partner, they, they get to do what they want. And so in this case, their dance partner is the NDP, and the NDP hopefully will be held responsible for what they've done. Um, you know, Fatine, my thought, though, is public pressure helps. And so I know I encourage people when I talk to them or when I do social media, call your, call your MP, M, member of Parliament. If you have a Liberal member of Parliament, call them call them often, arrange a campaign where you can call them and say, we're not happy with this. And no, a committee is not a replacement for parliament. So that's one way to do it. Uh, there are things that we can keep doing when we're asking these questions. We can try to put more pressure in, um, in committees. And, and actually, the government could recall parliament. They could, they could say, hey, we were wrong, and we're going to recall parliament. And they would have our full support if they decided to do that. Thank you so much for being with Doug Sharp and I today to discuss key pillars important to our nation's future and what we can do to strengthen them. You know, Canada is great. And Canada is free, but that freedom has been bought with the price of time and sacrifice by those that have gone before us. And Canada will continue to be great as people like you and I stay in the game. So again, I want to invite you to sign up for the National Leadership Briefing so you can stay connected with Doug's good work in our nation. And also, please do consider giving getting involved locally with the political party you feel called to influence. Go to national conventions and bring great ideas to the table. I've seen time and time again when people like you and I share our hearts with others and with our leaders in a spirit of honor and genuine care for Canada, it can make a game-changing impact. Thirdly, please share this show with your friends and family so they can find out more about what is happening and join in. Shows can be watched anytime on our YouTube channel, phone app, my public Facebook page, or at Fateen TV. Lastly, we want to invite you to join our team. As a nonprofit program, this show was made possible today by the generous donations of people who love Canada and want to see it strong for generations to come. As a partner, you will enable us to keep on air nationwide, speaking to the issues shaping our future. And when you sign up to partner for $50 a month or more, you will receive a special gift from us as a token of our heartfelt gratitude. Please feel no pressure at all, but if you do want to partner, you can call six. 613-552-5572 or visit fateen.tv today. God bless you. God bless your loved ones and God bless Canada. We hope to see you next week.